Lydia. Welcome to the Organized 365 podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on here today. Yes, we are so excited to have you. I am joining you from Cincinnati, where it's always cold in the winter, and you are in Florida, where it's currently cold in the winter. So we will just uh, snuggle up under blankets and have a great conversation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How did you first find Organized 365? So I actually found the Professional Organizers Think Tank podcast mm. first. This was in 2016, I think. I searched bookkeeping in my podcast app because at the time I wanted to start my own bookkeeping business. So I was just looking for a podcast on people who have done that before to get some information. And you had one episode where you talked about bookkeeping and accounting and stuff for your organizing business. And I just love the episodes. So I was like, oh, like this is kind of similar. I'll just binge through the rest of it. And at some point you said something about your normal podcast. And I thought that was your normal podcast. So I was like, <laughs> wait a minute, there's more of this. So I went and found your Organized 365 podcast. And I think I've listened ever since. So that was, it must have been, I, I can't remember if it was 16 or 17, but it was somewhere in that time frame that I started listening through. And I've listened like every Friday ever since, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a lot of listening. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I love that podcast. It still exists. So if you want to start oh, really? like a solopreneur or even you're thinking about hiring contractors, any kind of a service business, like I pretty much tell you everything. I, I don't, mm -hmm. I hold back. I probably tell too much. Yeah, <laughs> it, was a, to do that. it was a great podcast. I, I enjoyed listening through it. And I mean, once it was over, it kind of did feel like, oh yeah, she's given us all the information. Like there's literally nothing else, you know, right. to talk about or anything. <laughs> you just have to like go do the work. But um, yeah, I really enjoy that podcast too. It's like 17 episodes, I think, or it might mm -hmm. be down to 13 because we eliminated some that were like really specific to that time, but um, mm -hmm. not generalizable. That is the hardest part. Like when you want to start your own business, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. Like you don't know what you don't know. Let me just tell mm -hmm. you. Exactly. I don't know what I don't know now <laughs> in my business. It's harder to get information about where I'm going now. Like I literally just met with some people on our team and I was like, okay, here's the problem. We're doing stuff no one's ever done before. Like if I wanted to have a car dealership and I was at a certain amount of revenue, I could look at a million other car dealerships and know like how you scale mm -hmm. that. But when you create a company based on your intellectual property, like there are no answers. So mm -hmm. that podcast, the professional organizers think tank podcast is like every single professional organizer pretty much realizes all of a sudden, oh, you mean you'll pay me to organize? Like that is mm -hmm. like our happiest day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we're like, how much do we charge you? How do we charge you? How do like, we don't know any of the business mm -hmm. part. So it's all the, the business part. And most of it was pulled from my experience in direct sales. So anyway, yeah, yeah. I, um, Loved recording that podcast and I leave it up because I think that it is a great, you know, just knowledge and information for you to then rabbit trail on. So did you start a bookkeeping business? Yeah. Yeah. That was my goal in college was I got a degree in accounting and my goal was to be a stay at home mom that had a business because I saw, I knew that if you went into accounting, if you worked for a firm, you're going to have to work crazy, stupid hours during tax season. And I knew that I wanted to be more available for my family someday. So um, I actually worked for our local chamber of commerce at the time and I got to meet oh. business owners and a lot of them seemed genius. Yes. That a lot of them, genius. a lot of them seemed kind of um, like anyone could run a business. I, I met some of them. I thought, okay, if you can do this, I can do this. Like <laughs> it'll be fine. So at that point I started getting my, you know, QuickBooks certifications and started trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my clients. So yeah. So I think I started my business in the spring of 17 and so I've, years. yeah. And I'm, I'm still right, running so. it from home and I have young children and I'm flexible around their schedules and I can work whenever they have it and I can keep the clients that I want and get rid of the ones I don't want. And, um, and I find kind of a sweet spot in what I do as well. So yeah. And that is, I mean, so yeah. I work with, I worked with companies that they have someone on staff doing the manual entry and I come in behind them and do the double check. Cause they're not, they're not accountants. They just know like 
that small section of their bookkeeping that they do. And then I make sure, and I'm the double check behind it. So they have better checks and balances. And then I work with their CPA to do their tax return and to do their audits and things like that. So I'm like the in-between person that I don't do the manual entry for them and I don't do the tax return, but you need somebody in the middle who understands accounting, but doesn't do all the pieces, but just kind of can double check to make sure it's all correct. So that's what I do for clients now. So is that kind of like what a controller would do? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, I'm learning all my terminology. (laughs) Um, Exactly. Yeah. So, so I I do that for a bunch of different clients that they're not, they're not big enough to have somebody full time to do that, but they need someone doing it at least once a month to reconcile everything, um, to make sure their journal entries are posted, to make sure that their like reporting is getting done and that they get, you know, monthly financial statements and all, but they don't their staff person can't necessarily do it because they, yeah. they're not just doing their bookkeeping. They're normally doing all the admin work as well, but they need someone else and they don't want to pay CPAs rates to do that. Cause I'm not a CPA. I do have my MBA, but I'm not a CPA. So I can really fill that middle ground for people that need a business minded accountant, if you will, helping them through it. Okay. And back and to our it. original, like <laughs> how you start a business. Yeah. Here's what I found starting a business from no revenue to like a hundred thousand dollars a year. There's a Mm -hmm. lot of information on how to do that. Mm -hmm. There's some information on how to grow to a million dollar business. Um, and then after that, like you're on your own resources. I have (laughs) (laughs) like five resources. You're on your own. (laughs) And from one million to ten million is like uh what I've determined is if you can get from one to ten million, you can get to whatever number you want because there's literally no resources for you and you just have to you just have to like build your bridge as you're crossing it on your own Mm -hmm. over the pit of despair. (laughs) It's just like, (laughs) I've been doing this for three years and I'm like, "Mm," like a third of the way through the pit of despair. (laughs) Um, So with that said, and I listen to a lot of business podcasts and this is not a business podcast, but I think a lot of people who listen to Organize 365 have a side hustle or they're in business. I don't think there are enough business podcasts that just explain like business the way I want to understand it. So my question to you is, is there a certain amount of transactions, a certain dollar amount of revenue, a certain number of contractors or employees you have where it makes sense to add in your level of expertise into a company? Or do you notice that at a certain tipping point is when people usually seek out your services and then at another tipping point, they've outgrown you and they move on to like an actual controller in their, in their business? Yeah, I think um, the people that find that find my services are normally doing over a hundred thousand dollars a year because at that point they feel like it's a lot of money below that. They feel like, Oh, well, that's like a household income. But after a hundred thousand, they're like, if somebody we were to hire somebody that we didn't trust, or they could get a hold of the money, like that would be too much to lose and everything. So most of my clients are between a hundred thousand and a million. Okay. And then after they go up from a million dollars they're Well, I have a few that are over a million a year um, in revenue. Um, but they don't have as many like transactions that they're doing. Like it's like they do grants and stuff like that. So it's like, okay. you know, one check for like, you know, s- you know, 60,000 and, you know, different things like that. Um, but then really after you go up from, I would say around 5 million is when you would have definitely somebody like full time mm-hmm. on your staff handling all of these things. So I mean, I, that's a huge range of a hundred thousand to a million, but yeah. for some of these guys, they go through that pretty quickly, how they, yes. once they, once they figure it out, then they can scale pretty fast from there. Yeah. It's once you get product market fit, like mm-hmm. if you figure out what it is that you're selling and who you're selling mm-hmm. it to, and you can articulate that well, which I'm still working on. My problem <laughs> is I sell too many things, <laughs> but we need all of it. It'd be so much easier if. I mean, there are a lot of opportunities in what I'm doing, but it would be so much easier if I was like in an automobile sales and I had a certain tire and then I went after that tire market. Mm. But now I'm like creating, I'm not even in the home organization field. I'm kind of like in planning. I don't know. I don't know. It's what we're creating. There isn't a line item in your household budget for organized 365. It's not Mm. like if your HVAC goes out, you're going to replace it. Yeah. If you're going to go to the grocery store, you're going to pay for education for your kids, camps, all that. There's no line mm-hmm. item for becoming productive at home. Mm. And so 
So that's challenging on my side, but transactions. So it's a big thing we're talking about inside of Organize 365. Can you think about the number of transactions people have when they come to you and then like the, the lower and upper limit of that? So I think the lower limit is at least a hundred a month. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot. Like if you, if, if someone has to look through every single transaction and double check to make sure everything is there and attached, like yeah. if someone has to look through every receipt to make sure it's attached, to make sure that you have all your backup for your taxes, like that's a lot every single month. And then the upper limit is probably maybe like 500 transactions you you're probably I know you're way over that I, I just know your business and I know you're way over that you probably need like two people like just doing the admin oh work gosh, and one person overseeing them all of our systems and the problem is the pluses and minuses is the subscription plan because that subscription mm -hmm. plan is monthly and we have two yep. of them and so that's yep. 1500 transactions per month yep and then you have state tax on top of that so all the taxes like oh my gosh so yeah i mm -hmm. there are so many i should do a business podcast um there are so many things i've learned about business that i break every model of business because i'm a teacher i'm not a business person i am i'm not an mba i'm a preschool teacher so mm -hmm. even like we are moving to another another website for our store we'll have mm -hmm. it up by july um and the guy who does the programming on their end is a teacher also. And then mm -hmm. I explained how we run the organized 365 store. And he's like, oh, there's no, there's no program out there for you. <laughs> we can't do Shopify because we sell courses that have a physical component to them. Shopify People don't let you do that? Not with also a membership site and an app mm. and all these other things. Like, so we have, we're going to big commerce. So we have to go to big commerce. But when you go to big commerce, you can only level set based on like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or not by like, I'm in the productive home solution or I'm in the Friday work box or I'm in this. And so we gate and tag things based on whatever courses you want to do that are not in a linear path. <laughs> and then, so you know this, every single transaction that comes into the company has three fees on it before it even gets in the door. So there is a bank fee, there's an authorized debt net fee, and then there's some other ask a dental fee. Well, mm -hmm. then big commerce has a fee. And then when we get our ERP, the ERP has a fee. And I'm like, are you telling me we're going to have five fees on every single subscription plan? And they're like, yes. I'm like, oh. it's just, um, and then you have to track all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to keep it by account to make sure that everyone's paid their full subscription by name. And you have to like make sure, that, and heaven forbid, a credit card gets declined. You have to trace it back to who it is oh, that's and fat. check it up. And <laughs> I mean, that has a spreadsheet. Everybody knows yeah. like. That's like, okay, we need to update your bubble. And then that has to be mm -hmm. manual. It's manual. It's insane. You almost need to have like three different companies under Organize 365 so you can have your three different like systems to like just take payments. Okay, we are going to get to your story. Okay, now you blew my mind. So we are, we have multiple entities under Organize 365 mm -hmm. because. We are a intellectual property company. We are a manufacturer. We are a distributor. <laughs> yeah, you almost, talking, oh my gosh. yeah, you almost yeah. need like three different, like three or four different, like actual companies under the umbrella. So that just for like the financial side, so you can have everything separated. So it's yes, not that's why we're big going thing. to an ERP because we yeah. broke QuickBooks. We broke yeah. QuickBooks. I didn't even yeah. know you could do that. Why not? This is what happens when you're a stay-at-home mom with a preschool degree and you're like, you know what I think we should do? I think that Company. Yeah, it'd be fine. So anyways, I think this is a fun rabbit trail um, yeah. because this little itty bitty conversation, if you take nothing out of it, like Lydia, you are uniquely gifted and created to support businesses that are six figures going to seven figures and um, overseeing moving from either doing the financials themselves or hiring a bookkeeping company and being a translator for their CPA. At setting them up for the their move from a million dollars if that's where they want to stay, which is fine, and or growing further mm -hmm. than that. My uniqueness is just so unique. I've talked about it on a podcast for nine and a half years, plus other podcasts. So we'll move on. Everybody knows all of that part. But that is just so fascinating. Thank you for sharing uh, behind the scenes. What's the name of your business? Are you are you taking clients? 
Um, the name is DAC Balance, Debits and Credits Balance. I thought that was fun at the time. I probably wouldn't name it that again. Um, but yes and no on taking new clients. So Did you I say yes feel, and no? Yes and no. I always say, say like, oh, I'm pretty full. But then I feel bad when people message me and they're like, oh, I need help. I'm like, of course you need help. I can help you. So, so it's like, yes, maybe to some of you who message and no to Organize 365. <laughs> Yeah, I have, and I have learned over the years, like the personalities yeah. I like to work with, the types of businesses I like to work with, and different things. So um, I have been able to get a little more selective with who I have and everything as clients, um, thankfully. Um, so yes and no, send me an email if you want to chat about any of this. So. And I'm sure you know people. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you know people. And maybe you are listening to this and you're like, Ooh, I would like to actually start that business. So could they like, oh, yeah. take your brain on that? Yeah. Oh yeah. The accounting field in general, you know, I have all this weird random knowledge. So the accounting field in general is declining at a rapid pace. It's because terrible. exactly what you said, like you got your degree, but then um, I have two cousins that got their accounting degree and they literally had to pay for hotel rooms to sleep for four hours to go back to work when they were in busy season, like it almost mm -hmm. broke both of them. And they are really strong women. I, I, mm -hmm. I remember when they were doing it, I was like, I don't even know how you're surviving. Like their parents would literally bring them food and clothes because I don't know how you live through that. And I don't think that, uh, well, I don't even know that that's happening as much now as it used to happen. Cause I just don't think as a society that we, you know, will stand for it as much as we did in the past. But at the same time, like accounting is essential. <laughs> you have to, hiring 82,000 IRS agents like you have to have your accounting and your numbers done yeah. so there there is I will say in my business there is a bridge between bookkeeping and your CPA and as the business owner you are responsible for everything that's on your tax return even when the CPA does it like it comes back on you not on the CPA so you have to understand your financials so um so yeah, we have somebody that is in between bookkeeping and CPA now, and we have weekly meetings where I now really understand my numbers. And that says a lot because mm -hmm. I have an elementary teaching degree. <laughs> all right. So Lydia, let's talk about you. Who lives in your house with you? <laughs> I know you started all this just like me. Like I started direct sales so I could be a stay-at-home mom. I started Organize 365 so I could work around my kids' schedules. You started this business so you could work around these invisible children. That's what my dad called them, the invisos. <laughs> So did you get any visible children? I did. I have two visible children. Um, Kezia is four. She just turned four in November. Oh. And Amelia is nine months, um, nine months old. And then my husband, who is a head pastor um, of our church. So oh, that's my little nice. family. Very nice. So you found um, the professional organizer think tank. You were getting ready to start your business, which you did. What about your home? Getting your home organized, going from a married couple to a mom with two little kids and working from home. Like, mm -hmm. what was that transition like? When did you uh, add in more of the organizing components? So when I first started listening you know, when you're young, Mary, you don't have children. You don't have a lot, of, a lot to manage. I'm sorry to say like, you know, life was great. There was, you know, we had our own stuff, but it is, it wasn't as overwhelming, you know, kind of carefree and everything we were working and all of that. So it wasn't as big of a deal, but the year before my daughter was born, my oldest daughter was born. We moved into this house, which is on a family road. So all of my in-laws live on the same road. We all live together and we love it. Um, so I moved into this house and, um, it's like a 2,700 ish square foot house. So it's, wow. I mean, it's pretty big, like, yeah. you know, for our age, I felt like it was kind of a big house and everything. Um, but the people who lived here before were my husband's great aunt and uncle, and she actually passed away very suddenly and he had dementia. So their kids actually came and moved him out, got all the stuff from the house they wanted, and they had no capacity to manage everything else in the house so and they I don't think they ever threw anything away you talk about like leaving stuff but I mean this house every drawer like all of it was filled to the brim of their belongings that their kids didn't want didn't want to manage and all that so um when we bought the house our goal, we had to get rid of everything. So I think we had four yard sales and estate sales and we still gave stuff away 
And even three years after that, I was still taking stuff to Goodwill just to like get it out of how, cause there was just so much stuff and I didn't, you know, and then, so we moved in, into the house in December and then I got pregnant with my daughter in like the springtime and I was so sick, like pregnancy, like really took me out and everything for a long time. Um, and then I was getting ready for a baby. So there wasn't, there was some emphasis on the organizing, but it was more about, oh my gosh, how is this going to change my business and our family and our first child? Like all, you know, it was just very overwhelming. Wow. And so that was in 2019. And so then after my daughter was born, that kind of changed something in my brain of like, oh, like I'm a mom now. Like this is like, I'm very, this is a lot of responsibility. Like I want to make sure there are things like organized and where you can find it and all that. So then during the pandemic, when that started, I was really like, okay, like, this is a great time to really get this house organized because we're home and all that. Um, So that's when I really started to get the house, like the house piece of it really, really organized. And then it's just kind of taken off from there. And you're in Florida. So no basement, no basement. Okay. Do you have any storage in your house? Oh yes. Yeah. So the lady that built this house, she built it with ample storage. So we have like, tons of built-ins in our bedroom and we have extra storage space like that closet behind me is just all storage we have a big garage like but it's also to my detriment because I've just like kept everything so like it's actually like in last fall I went through and I purged a bunch of stuff from storage and I like kind of reorganized where stuff was like and like everything so I mean and that's taking me what like four years to finally get to like all the storage stuff so yeah it's it's just just a lot so well because you built a business and bought a house and had two children and like Mm -hmm. life doesn't stop while Mm -hmm. you are organizing like your Mm -hmm. organizing needs to fit into your life Mm -hmm. so the estate sales that you had and the garage sales you had were all of those in 2019 um so they were late 2018 i think we did two in december and then i think we did two in the spring of 2019 yeah okay okay Weird random question, you know, mm-hmm. I add weird. <laughs> I mean, was there some stuff that you found that you're like, oh, this is awesome. I don't have to buy this because this is here. Or I can keep it. A hundred percent. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh yeah. There, there was definitely some stuff that we were like, oh, that's really great. We don't have to buy that. Like all her yes. storage shelving. And I was like, these are expensive at Lowe's. Like we're keeping all this. Like, so there was some yes. stuff that we, you know, kept and everything like that. But a lot of it was things that you would find in your great grandmother's house for sure. Like it wasn't like stuff we necessarily wanted to keep and everything and some of the stuff I look back I'm like I can't believe like I can't believe we got rid of that or you know or whatever but you know yeah it's fine did you feel like um I mean you did four estate sales instead of just one and maybe additional garage sales Mm -hmm. did you feel like the uh revenue from those was worth the effort that you put into them um I think the first couple of them were that I mean they had a lot of stuff and it, of course we sent the money back to um back to him for his care and everything like that um but for the other two no <laughs> like at some point <laughs> at some point well what That's we did account. was we yeah we had you know all the stuff laid out in the garage and we had the sale from you know whatever time in the morning until one o'clock but then we had scheduled one yeah, of no the bets. get over here yes we and had scheduled for um for them to come at that time yeah to like take it away and I think the last person who came they were trying to barter for some stuff and it was like one o'clock in the afternoon and I told them I said look the truck is coming at 1 30 anything you can take you can have you just have to be out of the driveway and I mean they their eyes got so big and they started taking all the stuff and I said I don't even care like just please take it away I do this will not come back into my house I have already taken it out so that's the best thing that we did after that one was just call the truck and they just took it all away it was great yeah, I do that after every garage sale. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably didn't make as much as you wanted to. Also, you weren't keeping the money. It was going to someone else. But it would have cost you money to have that all taken away if you hadn't gotten it, at least to the garage. Mm-hmm. So so it is a staging. Like when you find yourself in an estate situation, which that is the estate, even though the person has not passed, it is the estate. It was the estate mm-hmm. of the spouse. Um, it, there's a triage to it. I mean- if money is no object and you literally like live in a different country, then you can hire a service to come and do it all, which is very expensive. 
or you could do it all 100% yourself and even drive things to each individual donation center. And that's going to take you a lot of time, but you'll get absolutely every single penny out of it. And then there is a, a, a middle ground. And you just kind of have to say, in the beginning, you go, oh, it can't really be that hard. Like, surely our stuff is worth more than everybody else's stuff, even though everybody says it's not going to be worth anything. They don't know our stuff. Our stuff is so great. And then you have the first one, you're like, oh, well, that wasn't really that great. But maybe maybe it was the timing. Maybe it was the timing sale. So I'll have another one. You're like, oh, well, um, you know, and you just keep... Mm -hmm. It is a process. It's a process of letting go. It is a physical process of how much you can do in a certain amount of time. There is some financial benefit of having a sale. It's not no money. It's some money. Um, but yeah, so thank you for sharing those things because I think it's hard to not have the sale. It's mm -hmm. hard to not sell. It's hard to imagine that these items that cost so much when they were new have not retained very much of their value. And I think it was a little bit easier for us because when we were pricing things, we had no clue how much they cost or the memories behind it in the first place. So yeah. I'm sure, I think I put a marble table out for like 50 bucks, which I'm sure yeah. it was more expensive than that. But we just, I mean, we just, not that we didn't care, but we were just like, oh, if you're, if you'll take this away, then we will, you know, let you have it for this amount. So um, that was a benefit that we didn't have all that knowledge of, oh, how much this costs or when did you buy it or the sacrifices in your budget you made to buy it. We didn't know any of that. We just thought I need to get this out because I have my own stuff I need to put in this house. And that's what we did. Yeah. And to, to donate that table, a marble table, um, like you're probably going to have to pay the donation company to come take it, even if it's like $50 to come pick up all of the stuff. If you're going to use a service like um, Junk King, where they'll come and they'll take it and you pay mm -hmm. by the truck, they will donate it, but you have to mm -hmm. pay for them to get it out of your house and everything. It's going to cost at least $200 for them to just take that table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is, there is money that goes with this stuff. It's just not the same money as when you first got it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you moved, so when you got your house to your own house. Yeah. How did you start working on your own organization? Like what time of year was it? What did you do first? So I followed the 100 day organization plan. So I started in the kitchen. Um, I'm trying to think of the time of, I think it was in January that I started. I think I started the first round of January because I'm pretty sure I got it for Christmas as a Christmas gift for the 100 okay. day organization. I think I got it from my mother-in-law and my mom for Christmas. So then I started in January with the home um with or with the kitchen piece of it and just worked through it and you know after the first round like you're just decluttering but I really thought like oh man like under this but you don't realize is that as you work your way through the whole program you're moving stuff from the un from like the office back to the kitchen where it really belongs because you found stuff and so but by the time you get back to the kitchen again it's all the stuff that actually belongs in the kitchen is there so you're like oh I need to like declutter and organize Do again, again. <laughs> yeah. yeah so like that's what you don't realize after the first round is like oh you're just like almost sorting things sometimes of yes. where things really belong and where it makes the most sense and I would have like some office stuff in different rooms I'm like this just needs to go in the office you know I can consolidate all of these things so I think the first couple rounds were just kind of doing a lot of that of just sorting and like putting things in the house where I wanted them and setting things up and figuring out what furniture I wanted to get and all that so um that that was the first round for me um and all the episodes I think at the time you were coming out with the episodes of like okay so your first round is just like you're just decluttering and then the yes. second round you're just organizing and third round you're optimizing to be more or to be to be more productive and yeah. that was really helpful because then I could think oh, okay like I, this doesn't have to be the most productive perfect the first time if I'm getting rid of 40 percent of the stuff because I don't need it like good job for the first round, you know, and then keep going after that. So that was really, really helpful. Yeah. And as you're talking about that, I think about a jigsaw puzzle, like when you're going to do a jigsaw puzzle, like when I'm going to do it in a competition, mm -hmm. <laughs> not when I do it on my bed on tiny trays, but when I did it in a competition, like the first thing you do is you flip every single puzzle piece right side up. And then you mm -hmm. just start to sort them by color, like mm -hmm. edge pieces over here. And then everything else you sort by color. Like that is round one. Mm -hmm. Like you get rid of what you don't need and you uncover what is all of this stuff that you have and move them into the right spaces. 
-hmm. And then round two, you start working on all the individual colors. And then round three, you put it all together in one big puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. I think that when I say that it's frustrating because people want to get it done all at once mm -hmm. and they figure there must be a way to get it done all at once. But mm -hmm. literally from what I understand from Montessori and education, like you need to process through the space three times. Like if I just even think about your story, when you first moved into that house, you were not pregnant. You've been mm -hmm. pregnant twice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking your closet has probably changed a little bit, yes. oh, <laughs> you yeah. know, in the last mm -hmm. five years, it's like, okay, maternity clothes, no maternity clothes, you know, mm -hmm. all, all of it is probably yeah. continually changing. And mm -hmm. it's, you don't want to have the, you want to have the clothes that fit you for where you are in this mothering mm -hmm. season front and center. Yeah. I, I even like this last weekend, I went through our cup cabinet because we're changing from, um, I'm weaning my daughter from nursing to formula. So now we're using, yeah. you know, we're not using all the pump supplies anymore. So I just take those okay. out. And then all the random size bottles, I took those out because if they're too small for six ounces of formula, why am I keeping that bottle if we're never going to use it? Right. So I literally had to go through again and I thought, oh yeah, like we're changing you know, seasons again with children, like to a different phase, to different foods and all of that. So you have to change up all your, everything again. And I mean, anyone with young children knows you're always, like you say, every what, three to six months, to I'm months. changing. Three yeah. I'm changing quarterly. almost every space in the house of, oh, now she's crawling. Now she's doing this. Now I need to change where this goes. Like, I mean, and that's been like that for the last four years, you know, since my oldest daughter was born. So it's a constant, it's huh? the snow in a snowstorm, shoveling the snow in a oh, snowstorm for organizing. So, so oh my gosh, I it want is. to come hold your baby. Um, <laughs> it is pretty fun. So yeah, it's quarterly. It's every three to month, every mm -hmm. three to four months until your child is five. Mm -hmm. And then when they're five, it's three times a year at infinite. Like with children, mm -hmm. it's, it's every one of these little small years is a completely different year for mm -hmm. them. Like the first half of school is different than the second half of school is different than summer. And so you'll yeah. be on this trimester schedule until they launch off to college. And then even then it'll be like their first term of college coming home for the holidays, second term of college, what you're going to do in the summer is like, you'll mm -hmm. stay on trimesters for decades. Yeah, I believe it. And, and that's mm -hmm. been helpful too, to think, because even the other day I was thinking through just January through May of this year of how is Amelia going to develop? And then Kezi right. is going to be out of school and like, how is everything going to be different in a few months? So I'd really try to plan out, but that's about the farthest I can think right now is May, which I, you know, all these people, all these people who try to think through to the end of the year, like December, I I'm like, I, I can't even imagine like Amelia is going to be like fully walking and running around. Like it's going to, I don't even know like all the, all how she's going to develop on that pace. So having, you know, your system of doing it January through May and then the summertime and then the fall, like genius, like helps me so much to plan out as much as I possibly can. Yes. And I think even as they get older or if you don't have children, when you start to think about the cycle of work, mm -hmm. like the work productivity in the workplace is definitely seasonal mm -hmm. because vacations and things come into play. When you think about, um, it wasn't until recently where I started, you know, as I'm getting older, where I started thinking about like milestone birthdays for parents and siblings and anniversaries. And now, um, the next generation's weddings, you know, so, you know, those in advance and like there, are, it's all seasonal and you can really, mm -hmm. I agree with you. Like I can only really plan at a fairly detailed level for months. Like if you start talking to me about the summer right now, like I know I'm going to the beach in July. That's all I know. Like, I don't know anything else because if I use my mental capacity for that, then I lose my mental capacity for now. Like I just, I can't mm -hmm. span that far. Yeah. So is there anything you tried before you tried Organize 365? I have always loved having planners, like ever since Me high school, too. like I've always been a planner girl. I've always like writing things down. Um, so pretty much the only, well, having planners, I did like the home edit show on Netflix. Like that was fun. And I have I mean, bought their, didn't? I mean, it was great. And I have bought all of, um, you know, a stupid amount of their clear containers that I used to organize stuff, but it has only been after I have done the Lisa way of decluttering and organizing and all of that. Um, for everything. So I have those around the house to kind of keep everything separated and all that. Um, and then I've used other like little things. I follow other like Instagram accounts, you know, and all of that for just, just for fun and everything. But as far as like a system goes, like yours is really the only true, like home organizing system that I really used and I haven't needed a different one. 
So. Oh, that's good. Well, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so when was the first time where you were like, oh, like this is actually really organized. Like this is organized. It wasn't organized before. Like this is different kind of organization. Yeah. So besides like the physical spaces, like my kitchen, my laundry room, like all of that, I think it's more in my like mental organization and capacity a lot of like the mental load is kind of the hot term right now about all the moms finally realizing how hard it is to run like a home and children like and how much goes into it and everything but for me like that's the Sunday basket and like those are the blitzes and the planning days like that's my mental load so when people are like overwhelmed or I get more questions of like how like in the fall are you able to do like Cause I like run the fall festival for our church. We normally do a trip to Disney course, world yeah. and then it's my daughter's birthday. And then like work is crazy. And then there's Christmas and we do all the activities and we hit up all the farms and like, and I sing Christmas card, like all the things. And people are like, how are you like, I'm like, I use my Sunday basket and I like, I can manage it. Like, you know, it's for, for me, that's really what it is, is under, is seeing like how much I can really manage with the system that I knew, I know I couldn't have done that before I learned the skill of organizing um and just trying to help my friends and other people to see like this is how I can manage it and everything so I think that's been the biggest um difference that I've seen is just the mental load is manageable in my case so So first of all congratulations (laughs) second of all this is the can of worms that I am in in my PhD. <clears throat> so I've written a study to ascertain if the Sunday basket improves working memory and working memory is your mental capacity. Mm-hmm. So does it improve working memory? And uh, I gave my proposal to a secondary professor who specializes in working memory. And she said, wow, this is interesting. She said, this is very interesting. She said, I think you should test more than working memory because it might not be working memory. You should also do cognitive load. It's like you said, the mommy brain. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. I was like, how many things do you think we could have people do in the (laughs) survey? She goes, oh, we're having them do a diary. We're having them do like, we're having them do everything. Yeah. She said, the other thing that is fascinating, she said, in your study design, you are proposing that working memory can be improved in the exact opposite way that we have done it in psychology. So I can't remember because I don't understand yet, but basically I'm saying that if we reduce the mental load by writing down the tasks and externalizing the tasks, it will improve working memory. She's like, no, every single test we've done is improve working memory through like a computer video game and then tasks. She's like, you're doing it opposite. She said, either this is like going to be seminal work or Researchers have done this many times and it doesn't work. And that's why it's not published is because it doesn't work, but we don't know that because it's not published. So she's like, either you're really onto something or it's not going to work. <laughs> it's like, I think you're okay. onto something. I think you're onto I was something. Like, let's, let's test it and find out. So that's number one. And then the second part she said is what's interesting in my proposal that I did not identify is she said planning. It's actually about planning. And she says, there are not a lot of studies on actual planning. And we don't know where it is in the brain. She said, so I think it'd be really interesting for you to find out where it's located in the brain. And I was like, for my dissertation? She goes, no, for your life's work. I was like, you think I'm going to be able to identify where planning is located in the brain? She's like, yes, I do. But it's going to take you a while. I'm like, just like, okay. So, but, so then another person I talked to who's now my dissertation coach, she, I asked her and I said, I would like to create a theory, like the household organizing theory or the household productivity theory. How do you do that? She's like, oh, well, you do that through qualitative methods using grounded theory. And I'm like, what is grounded theory? And she's like, basically you talk to people who have achieved what it is that you want to do and you figure out how they did it. And then you find the literature to support it. She said, do you do it through interviews? I was like, what kind of interviews? It's like, I have over 200 Wednesday podcast interviews. She goes, transcriptions of those is how you do it. She's like, you just, I was like, wow. Oh my gosh. Because yeah, because I do think it is this, we have our brains back. I, mm-hmm. 
how do we show that? How do we support that? How do we design a study? It's not going to be you, Lydia, because you're going to do the bookkeeping of that. But somebody <laughs> listening is going to be like, oh, like I just keep talking enough on this podcast for you guys to literally email me so I can get on Zooms with people who know more than I do because it's organized 365. Like we need to not solve this problem, but provide resources and systems for this pro problem and amplify them so that more women can get their minds back. Mm -hmm. So we can enjoy the holidays. So you can enjoy your babies and have a business mm -hmm. and be in your house. And mm -hmm. that's what we want. Like we want to be able to live our lives to the fullest of whatever we want to pack into our lives with our mental capacity, our cognitive load, however we're going to describe it. How mm -hmm. do we do that? So somebody listening right now is supposed to be emailing customer service and they mm -hmm. will get it to me. And then you will help me in doing this because I do think that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's it's the true mental load that yes. is helping it it's all in my Sunday basket. It's all in the box. And I can see like I can handle more because I don't have to think about things all the time and projects and all that. And even I don't have to think far in the far super far in the future. I can think until May. Cause even like the other day I was thinking like the spring is gonna be just really busy. So I was like, okay, how can I change up the household stuff to make it streamline easier and everything so it's like okay mm. well I'm just gonna go to BJ's and I'm gonna buy enough household supplies until May and yes. I'm gonna buy enough diapers until May so I don't have to think about that anymore totally. so that's what I did so I went and I went through all the stuff in the house and I figured out about how many you know Tide Pods trash bags diapers um bars of soap like all the things that just are so annoying when they run out and I was like yes. okay if I can at least check all that off what are the other things I can do? I went through all of her, all of my daughter's shoes. I went through, you know, clothes and just tried to figure out all those things to free up time in March to think of other things and other projects that I know is going to be really busy um, to kind of help me out in the future. So it's that type of stuff that even listening to the podcast, you know, however many years it's been has helped me to, you know, reframe like my thinking and organizing and planning and being productive so that I can enjoy my work and my children and my home and I don't have to stew about it or anything. So yeah, that, that's what it says. Well, I think you're onto something. To be honest, like if you go back to 2019, you're moving to this house, you're not even married yet. Like you couldn't buy four months worth of things at a warehouse because you didn't know what you needed, but also mm -hmm. you didn't have the financial resources for that yet. Mm -mm. And so as you become more productive, more organized and more productive, your income earning capacity increases, but also you stop wasting a lot of money mm -hmm. because you don't have to buy things when you actually find things or like, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm, um, we could like in the past, I'd be out of, I'd be hungry and I'd be out of time. And so I'd go get takeout. Um, mm -hmm. but when you're more organized and you're thinking through your day and you're like, okay, I'm going to be out of time today, but I've got a Stouffer's lasagna in the freezer. So if I just put that in at four, because I've already planned out my day, and then I go do these things in the house, then by mm -hmm. five, dinner's going to be ready, even though I don't have time to make dinner at five, because we have to leave at mm -hmm. 5.30. And so all of that organization saves you money by organizing your time. And then as you save your money in that way, all of a sudden in your budget, you're like, oh, okay. So we aren't as spending as much on takeout because now I'm cooking from home because I know I always work from home on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we always eat at home on Tuesdays and Thursdays where we used to not. Well, now, instead of going to the warehouse once a month, I could go every six weeks. I could go every eight weeks. I could go every 10 weeks. Like you slowly um, increase this amount of time. And also when you don't go to the store, you don't buy the impulse things because mm -hmm. you're oh, yeah. not there every single time. Um, Walmart delivery slow... is yes. my jam. It's my jam. Mine too. Mm -hmm. Mine too. Greg will say, well, I was thinking we might need blah, blah, blah for later. I'm like, okay. He's like, you're going to the store. I'm like, yep. <laughs> Two o'clock. Ding dong. Door there it is. Here. Yeah. Like, and yes, it costs because I tip or whatever. So it costs like $15 yeah. or something. Yeah. Best $15 I spend all week. Are you kidding 100%. me? Do you know how many Epsom salts I get? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't yeah. have to go there, load it in the car, pay for it, load it in the car, mm -hmm. bring it back. Like, yeah, I don't want to do any mm -hmm. of those things. Me either. But you can't get to that. You have to know what you want. 
-hmm. in the past I had to go to the store to figure out what I wanted because I didn't know what I wanted. Like Mm -hmm. it is a, it it is a trickle down effect. Your organization continues to trickle down and you get more time and money as it goes on, but you don't really realize it. And there's no way to jump right to that part. You Mm -hmm. have to organize. I find for me, organizing the physical spaces, creating the Friday work box, creating the Sunday basket organizes my brain and creates a mental inventory in my head of what I have Mm -hmm. so that I could play around with it in my working memory in my head when I'm going to sleep or driving forever in the car and not at home, but I can think about all the things I have at home and what I need to do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doing the same thing. Oh yeah. And even, I think you talked about this on a podcast too, about um, if you, if women work from home, their home has to be organized first and then their business has to be organized. Yes. And that is a hundred percent because if I'm here working at, from home in my office and I know that there's not a plan for dinner, the laundry is piled up and I don't have a plan for it. And if there's still stuff out from Christmas, like I cannot focus, I, I can't just put it away and just focus on work unless there's obviously if there's like a huge deadline then I can, you know, But generally my house needs to have a bunch of order in it before I can really focus on my business and working for that, which, I mean, I don't know if it's just because we're women, I don't know, but, um, but having all of that organized and knowing, and even if it's not all done, if I at least know, okay, well, all I'm doing today is making sure all the towels get put away, or all I'm doing today is worried about one load of dishes. And then I can kind of put it away as long as I have a plan and I've thought through plan. what yeah. I can put away. Cause I mean, you're never going to be done with laundry. You're never going to, you're never going to be done with dishes or anything like that. And at least if I know, okay, for dinner, we're just going to go to Chick-fil-A like check. And then I can kind of move on with the rest of it. But I mean, people that don't, plan out or don't think I could see how you'd be crazy. I'd be crazy if I didn't have a plan for all this. It's exhausting. It is literally exhausting. Yes. You know, there's that meme that says, choose your heart. I think it is like Mm -hmm. being married is hard. Being divorced is hard. Mm -hmm. So planning is hard. Living without a plan is hard. Choose your Mm -hmm. heart. Like it's not like one is easier than the other. Yeah. Um, You just feel like you have more control in one than the other. Okay. So once you talk yeah, but once ahead. you start, but once you start planning, you become addicted and it becomes not, it, it only becomes hard to find the time. Yeah, that was the hardest thing for me. Like over Christmas break, it was just hard for me to find the time to do it when the girls didn't need me, when we weren't doing a family thing, when I wasn't just exhausted from the holidays or, you know, that week, like I just want to like take a nap. Like it was the only hard thing was just finding the time when I was alone and I wasn't tired to really think through everything. But after you get started planning and you kind of know like, okay, I need to think about these five things. And then I need to think about our routines. Like, I mean, yeah. it's addictive after that. And it just I works. Totally it just agree. helps so much. Like, I totally agree. yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about your Friday work box. Do you have one for your business? Yes, I do. All right, tell me about it. So it's overflowing at the moment because it's January. <laughs> So it's, you know, for accountants, it's a lot right now. So, um, I, um, I've used it in different ways over the years. Like I've also learned how to use a Google calendar in the last year, which I was only paper before that, but I've learned to use a Google calendar and that was life-changing, you know, last Mm -hmm. year when I finally decided to do that. Um, so I try to go through client stuff at least every Friday. I don't always get to the live um, with whoever does it. Um, I think Stephanie does on Fridays. Um, so I don't always get to it, but I at least try to think through all my clients each week of like, okay, what do they need for next Mm -hmm. week? How can I schedule it out in my Google calendar? Like when am I actually going to get this stuff done? And right now my calendar, like, it's just like ridiculous, but I'm like, well, at least it's all in the calendar. Like yesterday I went through and I put everything on my calendar for all the client stuff and like no, no work had been done, but I just felt so much better afterwards. Cause I was like, okay, at least I can see all the things that need to get done and where it needs to be. It's not just in my brain. It's at least on my calendar. And I just felt yep. so much better. Like, oh yeah, this will all get done eventually. Like, I'll you know, I'll work things around for how to get all this done. So, but no work yeah, was just... actually finished. It was just right. on the calendar finally. Yep. Yeah, that's how I do. Well, that's how I do Organize 365. That's how I do all my work for my PhD. Um, Having that physical placeholder, even in a digital way, um, 
does let your brain let go of the trying to remind you that you have to do this. Don't forget it. Um, mm -hmm. And I love it so much more on a calendar because it actually takes up the space that it will take to actually do that. I'm sure you're very good at mm -hmm. estimating now how long certain things take, certain clients, certain meetings, just mm -hmm. all of those things. Yep. And that's how you know that you don't have capacity for another client right now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Whereas if you didn't have that, you might say, well, I could squeeze one in and you will get the work done because you're a person of high integrity, but your kids will be the ones that suffer or your mm -hmm. spouse. And you don't realize that they're the ones mm -hmm. where the time is coming from. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what do you think you have more of now? Capacity. I mean, really, like I can get, I can take on a lot more different little projects to get them done. Um, because I can plan out on Sunday when I'm going to do them and the little pieces of the project that need to get done. Like, all, like also like all of my photo albums are up to date. You know, I'm working oh on Oh my all gosh. Those. You're like superwoman. Like, like I'm I working. Well, right now I'm stop listening to you now. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm working on the ones from last year. So I, I do an album for each trip that we go on and then one for the year. So right now I'm working on the one for our Disney trip last, last November and then the year one. Um, but I had my, on my list this week of like, okay, all I have to do this week is go through and like all the pictures on my phone that I want to put on the album. That's all I have to do for that project this week. And like, I can work on so many more bigger projects and little chunks yeah. than just sitting down and being like, oh, I'm on Shutterfly and I have to do this whole project. Like I've gotten a lot yeah. better at doing the little pieces to everything that need to get done. And then they all get done because I work on it little by little. So and then how are you using this extra capacity and this extra time that you have? Um, I mean, all of it goes to the children, <laughs> you know, like the children take up a lot, you know, so, um, but it's that. And then it's in the evening sometimes if I just don't want to do something or if I just want to sit and mm -hmm. just scroll my phone or whatever, like, I don't necessarily feel as guilty because I know, oh, it's all gotten done. Like, and I had this extra time or whatever. And um, so that's nice too. Okay. That's just. That's huge because I do that too. And I feel good about that. But I'm trying to remember if I would have had time to do that when my kids were your kids ages and running a business. I mean, I know my big thing was I wanted to, I wanted to get old and retired so I could do puzzles. <laughs> and when I was able to start doing jigsaw puzzles about four years ago, I was like, I've made it. <laughs> I had time mm -hmm. to do jigsaw puzzles in the evening for a couple of hours. Like I've, I've mm -hmm. made it. So I know I did not have time to do that when my kids were, were younger. Oh, I did scrapbooking and things that I enjoyed. I did enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that is so empowering to hear that you are able to do that. Mm -hmm. I think it's so awesome that you have phone scrolling time. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody needs to just have like time, like mm -hmm. just time. It's kind of like, you know, if you're doing like budgeting, like money that you don't have to account for where you're going to spend it. Mm -hmm. So in time, time that you don't have to account for what output came from that time. Mm -hmm. like, I love yeah. that for you. Yeah. And I, I mean, everyone needs something for their mental sanity. So sometimes yes. even if I'm just scrolling and looking at like the pictures of my friends and like, you know, people are be becoming a little bit more real on social media. I feel like to share like this didn't go well mm -hmm. today or like this was fine. Right. So it's also nice as a refresher of like, okay, we're all in this. Like yes. no one yes. had a perfect day. Like you know, things didn't go the right way for some people and it's fine. Like tomorrow's a yeah. new day. So it's, you know, it's like rallying at the end of the day, like, okay, like no one, <laughs> no one is judging anyone. We all are just mm -hmm. in the trenches together. So it's great. So is there anything you wish you had known sooner? Um, probably just, I look back when I was in college about managing my time and I think I did a fine job. You know, I still got my degree in four years and all the things, but um, <laughs> I just felt more overwhelmed than I probably should have if I would have learned ahead of time how to manage my time better, mm -hmm. and, you know, earlier and all of that. So that's one thing that I want to make sure that my girls know um, from a young age as how to, is just what it takes and all the planning that it takes and that it's normal to have to plan every week for your week and every season for your season. Like that's very okay. And very normal to have to, to do that, um, for yourself. So in teaching my girls how to do that as well. well. So I can't wait until they're just a little bit bigger and they're in the kids program because you will mm -hmm. love it. Cause on Saturday they clean their rooms and do like their housework. And on Sunday mm -hmm. it is all planning. Like they literally mm -hmm. plan out their week. 
Yeah. I have seven-year-olds planning out their week on Sundays. Yeah. It is so awesome. Yeah. My four-year-old's going to love that. She's a very like type A type, you know, for very, very much a firstborn. So I know she's going to yeah. love that. Um, my youngest, my, my youngest daughter, um, her personality is a little bit more wild. So I don't know how that's going to go with her. She's just a baby, but she's already like a lot. So I don't know how she's going to do, <laughs> but we'll see, you know, five, six years. We'll see how it goes. So what advice would you give to someone who's like listening to this and they're like, oh, well, I, I didn't realize it was going to be such a gradual process. Like, um, what, what would you say to somebody who's just starting out? Like, what, what, what would be your advice to them? Um, probably just to obviously like get the Sunday basket, get all the things, you know, but the blitzes are amazing, especially if you have children to plan out back to school and Christmas and all the things like do the blitzes to get a good feel for how it feels to be organized in like a certain season. And then, um, just make sure that you take time to plan out your season, like do the planning days, make sure that you can really plan out what you're going to be doing because it's, I mean, I don't know how you can get away without doing it that way. So, and it is gradual, but along the way, it just gets easier and easier and easier. And there's no like finish line, I wouldn't Mm -hmm. say for it, especially if you have children, because it's always going to be changing. Like you said, my closet's continually changing. Like I just throw out like literally half of my clothes because I'm like, oh, these are maternity. Like they got to go. So, um, but just just make it a habit of just planning and organizing and making your, you know, doing your Sunday basket and all that. And life does get easier to manage until you're like me and you're like, oh, I have all this capacity. I can just add on 10 new projects. That's fine. So it's, then it's you can just weird to talk about how much capacity we have, isn't it? Like, mm, it's yeah. just, I should, I should not still have capacity and I still have capacity. I think as you're talking, I'm realizing like the organization is a season. Like it does just mm-hmm. become habitual and it's not like mm-hmm. you have to do like you did in your first move in unless you have a big unexpected event but the planning is continual mm-hmm. so the organization is a season but then the lifelong planning is is continual and it really is how you get more and more capacity and mm-hmm. working memory is defined by mental capacity that's why i think this really is working memory and not mm-hmm. just cognitive load theory which cognitive load theory does explain why we get overwhelmed, but I don't know if it explains how to get unoverwhelmed. I'm going to have to go leave and go mm. research that now. Like I'm always down all these rabbit. That's how I'm using my external excess capacity yeah. is reading more and more and more literature on trying to understand what they've already researched and understand and how we apply that in the home setting as opposed to the school school and work setting. So Lydia, thank you so much. This has been such an awesome conversation. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yes. Thank you for having me.